now let's talk about Kennedy's new frontier, or as he calls it, the new frontier, because he's from Boston, or from Massachusetts, and they talk about it. I'm sure they say the same about us. Yeah, Frontier. Frontier. So anyhow, the Kennedy style. When he became the nominee for president in 1960, he announced his plan, and he called it the New Frontier. Okay, and it's going to be a plan that encompasses improving the economy, education, healthcare, uh, civil rights, and of course our space program. So let me just let you listen to him talk for a minute. We're only going to listen to really about a minute's worth of this. But I want you to hear his accent plus, you know, listen to his idea. Because this speech is sometimes on your state test. Today, the third struggle are all over. That all the horizons have been explored. That all the battles have been won. That there is no longer an American frontier. But I trust that no one in this administration would agree with that sentiment. For the problems are not our fault, and the battles are not our run. And we stand today on the edge of a new frontier, the frontier of the 1960s, the frontier of unknown opportunities and perils, the frontier of unfilled hopes and unfilled threats. Woodrow Wilson's new freedom promised our nation a new political and economic framework. Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal promised security and succor to those in need. But the new frontier of which I speak is not a set of promises. It is a set of challenges. It sums up not what I intend to offer to the American people, but what I intend to ask of them. And that kind of goes along with his quote that he says in his inaugural address, you know, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Okay, so uh, a book that we discussed in the last chapter is The Other America, and it said that in the 1950s and moving into the 60s, of course, 50 million Americans are living in poverty. So as part of Kennedy's domestic program, he wanted to do something about that. So under his um, leadership as president, Minimum wage was increased. Social security benefits were extended to help more people. And the welfare system was improved and they made adjustments to it to try and get aid to more people in a more orderly fashion, I suppose you could say. And he was interested in the status of women. <laughs> yes, he was. Um, Marilyn Monroe specifically, among others. We'll just say he was not faithful to his wife. <laughs> That's probably an understatement. Morning. Anyhow, but when I say he was interested in the status of women, I'm talking about um, how much women get paid. So in terms of, you know, are women and men getting paid the same amount for doing the same amount of work? And that's what his commission investigated. And this commission is what's going to lead to the Equal Pay Act passed in 1963, which says you get equal wages for equal work. So let's say that Garrett and I are you know, mowing somebody's yard. It is illegal for them to pay him more money because he is a guy than they would pay me. Okay, maybe they can pay him more because he did a better job, but they can't pay him more because he's a guy. Now, the economy. He gave tax cuts to the middle class and he's going to have military spending that's going to, you know, help the economy. Because, you know, of course, we're building all those nuclear weapons. We've got NASA going on. We've got, you know, all of these operations going on that are going to provide jobs for people. And in order to pay for all of this, we have deficit spending, okay, where we borrow money so we can afford all of these programs. You know, borrowing stuff from places like China, okay, or other China. places. Who knows? <laughs> so anyhow, <coughs> excuse me. This is meant to jumpstart the economy, and it's that theory that in order to make money, you got to spend money first. Okay, so that's what the economy, that's how they were making it work at the time. Let's just do that now. Why do you think we have gazillions of dollars worth of national debt? Can we, we add start more to it? Money? Yeah, we're still waiting on that to happen. Not. It ain't ever going to happen. 
Okay, now civil rights, we're not going deep in depth into that because we did in the last chapter, but just know that Kennedy started out very timid. The reason he did, he had to have the Southern Democrats support in order to get elected, okay? But as things progress, he sees all the violence and everything happen, he becomes much more active in the civil rights fight. And then, of course, we got the space race, which we were losing. Because the Russians put Sputnik into outer space. How dare they launch a hunk of metal into outer space before we did? So we created NASA, <clears throat> 1958. But we're still losing. Because they're the ones, <clears throat> excuse me, that got the first dude into outer space. Yuri Gagarin, the Russian cosmonaut. What a guy. I think that cosmonaut is a way cooler thing than astronaut. They're the same thing, but cosmonaut sounds cool. But we're not going to be bested because then we're going to send Alan Shepard into outer space. He's eventually going to become a U.S. senator. Don't but, they shake hands? Huh? Don't they shake hands? No. Or who was it? I don't know. <laughs> Anyhow, so at this point, Kennedy is like, you know what? You may be beating us now, but I promise you, we will put a man on the moon before the end of this decade. And everybody's like, what? And NASA's like, how are you going to do that to me, Kennedy? Like, put a timeline on me. But we made it, or if you believe that. July 1969, we landed the first man on the moon. And so far, we're the only country that's done that. Neil Armstrong, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And tomorrow, we'll show you videos of the moon landing. If you believe it happened, I personally do. But it's a green oh, it's not fake. Hollywood, you conspiracy theorists.